We will have an addition to the consent agenda, and you've got the memo before you. So at letter G, we will add a transfer from OPD to Metro Narcotics, and then you will see a second memo that um, has a salary change from the original memo. So um, that will be G under consent. Then we will add at 7A to consider amendment to serving officer safely plan and attempt resolution to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. So those two changes, are there any other changes that any department has had? <coughs> All right, with those two changes, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Move we approve the agenda. All Second. right, All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. motion to approve the minutes with one correction. Okay. The um, July 21st meeting, item number 10, you know, we uh, granted a waiver of fees uh, for the temporary certificate of occupancy for Lafayette schools right. and Oxford schools. Well, the amounts in the minutes are the same and the amounts were not the same. Oxford's was a lot less. And I think we should have that right. But 
I can't, I can't remember the, it was 8,000 something, I guess. But Ashley will correct that. So with that correction, I move that we approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, I'm going to ask you to authorize the approval of accounts for all city departments. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I ask you to consider the consent of <coughs> the addition of letter G that I mentioned before. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. I had a few notes that I was going to point out. None of this um, affects the ad valorem request at all. What you're looking at does not have firm numbers on M82 because the state has still not approved an education budget. Um, and we are getting federal program money through the CARES Act as taxes that we throw at it. So that's what I'm doing webinars every time I come around. So the federal program revenue So moved. Just add the Lord request. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you both very much. Now we will talk through um, considering amendments to serving not the Rotational Plan and Tenth Resolution to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. And we will start that by asking uh, Mr. Allgood to come up to the, the mic and, and kind of update everyone on our numbers. Jimmy, so the 39 positive cases that are residents are are not counted. Yes, in they are they included in our numbers. Oh, the, they are. The okay. eight in 
And Bill Kenny stated that the hospital was able to provide care to anyone and everyone in our community at this time. The hospital does have surge plans to quickly be able to convert other areas of the hospital into regular beds and ICU beds. And within the four walls of the hospital can add an additional 40 to 50 beds in a short amount of time. So that would be their, their initial surge plan. Um, the hospital usually operates with about 30% of their patients from the Fayette County. You know, we've heard in meetings with Mr. Henning and others that it is a regional healthcare facility. And typically, he has shared that about 30% of their normal patient base is from Lafayette County, 70% from our surrounding counties. Today, 41% of the people in the hospital are from Lafayette County. But over the past 10 days, he said that has fluctuated from 30 to 40%. So not seeing a huge increase in number of patients from Lafayette County as far as percentages versus other counties. He stated that today the hospital does have its largest number of cases of COVID-19 patients that they have had. And that is, a, a lot of that is due to the long-term care facilities that have had breakouts um, over the past week. That has increased the numbers greatly. He did um, stress that individuals should really lessen our risk by not being a part of group gatherings. That is where they are hearing that most of the cases they're seeing are coming from, or just group gatherings, family gatherings. And Dr. Levy that we spoke with stressed that COVID-19, that there are three things we know. That COVID-19 is gonna be here for a while, that PPE and proper mitigation work, and that we've got enough data now to know who is dramatically affected. So I think the bottom line of our meeting was that they're stretched, but not in crisis mode. Um, so we've moved forward with data-driven decisions to this point, and we will continue to do so. One of the things that I'll point out is, you know, as we look at the data that indicates that our hospital capacity is made up of only 30 to 40 percent of the Fayette County citizens, and as our goal is to curb the spread and avoid people needing to be hospitalized, it's difficult to say that further requirements in the city of Oxford is going to really affect our hospital occupancy when at least 70 percent of the people in the hospital are from Oxford. You know, I mean, that, I think that's an important fact for the public to understand, too, is as many people are pushing for us to do more, do more, do more, and Oxford put in stricter regulations, do these things, I hear you, but I'm also hearing from the hospital that 70% of the people there are from Bruce and Calhoun City and Pontotoc and New Albany and surrounding Water Valley, counties around us that don't have the same measures in place. And so it makes it difficult to say that strengthening our safety measures in Oxford is going to really have a big effect on our hospital capacity. Um, today, I know a lot of people were interested in watching the press conference that the governor and Dr. Dobbs held today. And Dr. Dobbs is our Mississippi State Health Officer. And a quote that he, that he had during the press conference, I think, kind of sums it up. He said, if we can all just chill out for the next two to three weeks, the virus spread will slow. We are undermining our ability to start school and keep businesses open because we want to have dinner with friends from out of town. And Doc went on to say that the majority of new coronavirus cases the state is identifying are coming from social gatherings and community spread. The governor and the director of the Department of Health stressed repeatedly that going to weddings, to parties, and funerals is a bad idea right now. We've heard that repeatedly, but it continues to happen. I understand that there were large weddings in several venues outside of the city limits this past weekend, and they were scheduled for the coming weekend as well. These types of large gatherings are where we are finding large case generation. Um, so the things that we do today, as we know, are going to affect what our results are for the next several weeks. We've got to protect the lives and the livelihoods of our citizens. And so now is, you know, where we get to talk the hot potato of what are our next steps. Um, in the governor's press conference today, I will say that he put in place a statewide mandate for face masks in, I believe it's in retail businesses. I don't think it was in all businesses. Do you know, Jimmy? I, I watched it right at the end of the day. He and said public places. He said and public places and retail, and retail businesses. Okay. So he did, though. Um, our county has I not done a 
say gatherings and, and reunions. Did he say gatherings? I don't have a place to pull it up and, and, yeah. and look at it. Or, or can you be? Yeah, see if it can be put out. I haven't seen the word. Start with them trade and go from there. That's right. Brad, would you come up? Yeah. I was just wondering what you had going in the next three weeks if you had that scheduled down. Yeah, so we we have an event on the books every weekend, pretty much from now until November. Um, this weekend. Have we had anybody that we know of with COVID from baseball teams or soccer practices or? Not that I've been made aware of. You know, the majority of people that come are from Austin, so we would never know that. Right. I mean, it's true, though, that that's 
but I'm just talking about the Oxford. Out of 30, 14 to maybe three or four for Oxford, yeah. That's right. Yes, I mean, it's, a, it's keen to come in. Yeah. 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 The 30, 14, I mean, are you spread out onto three complexes? I mean, that'd be 12 fields? That, that's right. Um, I believe our schedule just came out. I was just going to look at what fields we feel like this weekend. Do you think if we um, did a, uh, a mask mandate for the fans, it would, uh, it would first of all, would it, would it hamper people from even showing up, or do you think uh, they would still? You know, I don't know about it. I, But now there's a. Well, they, they may rather do that than not be able to play. Yeah, yeah. sure. I mean, it's. Um, <clears throat> Becomes an enforcement issue, though. Who's going to enforce that? I mean, if, if we were to do that, I think we would have to hire some people to come or pay overtime to OPD officers or do. You know what I mean? I don't think we could expect the same people that are managing the fields to play games and all that to also be enforcing uh, masks. Well, you would hope. It, if you would hope if you have signs up that says masks must be. Try not to. Right. Just say it. But you do recommend masks in on your website for right. everybody. In our return play guidelines, um, I believe the wording, and it's on our website, that we can be responsible for putting it out to our team members. You know, masks are not required outdoors, but recommended. You know, that just goes to your. Have you seen anybody outdoors wearing masks there? I have not. So, Brad, do you, what other measures besides the mask can be implemented? You, you know, the, the, the thing that, that we see is um, the policy, if you will, is, you know, wait before the teams finish your games before you come in. Um, now, I, I don't doubt for a second that happens every time. So, uh, but what we are seeing one question I have.
That, that's the way I interpret that. It's where you can't maintain that social distance or if one of the other orders came through that's not covered by other restrictions. Six, six feet or a mask, yeah. So, so Brad, can you, uh, could you actually say anybody that's sitting in the stands has to have a mask on? Obviously, yeah. I, I know you could, but is there enough room outside there for people to go? Yes, there is. I mean, and what we've seen is as far now, especially during, during tournament play, are people sitting outside of the tent, not actually from through the gate. Um, we've taken our, our bleachers and we've put them directly behind the dugout with them off and the teams are using them on an auxiliary dugout so they're not all in the dugout they're not sitting on the bleachers and crib they're behind the dugout uh yeah some other things that we've done is we've hired a, a professional cleaning crew that they come through after every game and they spray down the dugout area and the stands and there we have one person dedicated to the bathroom of each squad so you know we're in my opinion we're doing all that we can I mean, is that we spread the games out a little bit more over time for that flow that will require a mask for all fans and coaches unless they're sitting way out making social distance. But throughout in the park, once you get past the gate, you gotta have a mask. Now, I've, I heard that when the first tournaments happened, um, maybe in Cordova, that's where I used to be, in Cordova, Sure, I would. Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't know why I think that we need to take a piece of salt, but um, I also don't get to vote. I, 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 think, I think with, with the small amount of tournaments he has over the next two to three weeks, uh, we I think we, we, we do what Jason said, spread the games out, ask people that, that, that sit in the stands maybe that you're going to sit here, but I, I think we just go ahead and go with it for, you know, at least a period of time. I don't know. Let's keep that second tournament. I mean, let's let's make sure we're going to cap that at stay where you're at this weekend if it works this weekend. I mean, let's not okay. jump up there at 60 teams. Yeah, I mean, we could, you know, for however long this, this period of time is, limit team count or... So how many, how many teams next, this weekend? 35? 33, 35. I think you can cap it at 35. Well, this, this, this week, no, I'm just saying. But that's low, but sometimes we'll have 60. Oh, you've had 112, the yeah, first one. I mean, it, it is small, it's, but it's all people from out of town. But it gives, us the, it gives us the opportunity to spread out the games. Yeah, but my, uh, my concern about, you know, just everybody in the school is uh, kind of over. Now, next few weeks, 
And right now, we're going to really have to be careful. And then we broke it down for another couple to three weeks. I think they'll be able to go to school, you know. So people's not going to really keep the mask in place. Because I watch them when I go around town to be together and got this, you know, see. That's a question earlier. You know, Dr. Dobbs is talking about the social gatherings, the weddings, the funerals, baby showers, birthday parties, that where you're in close social contact in a, in a smaller setting. I think M-Trade is a completely different environment. And has, have there been any reports of spread of, of COVID through youth baseball tournaments? I mean, everything I'm hearing is from the the social gatherings and the, and the parties and, and et cetera. I haven't heard any reports of baseball tournaments or kids travel teams being one of the causes. I just haven't heard that in any reports. about the parking areas. When people get out of their vehicles, do they congregate? Would it be useful to block off every other parking spot like we do in the parks? Would there be enough parking if you did that? Brad, you got a 30, 33 teams, 11 teams, and then on the... 34 teams and four per Vermont schools. And then 11 teams, and then do you know how many you have on the weekend of the 21st, 22nd? The, the 22nd right now, and that's a pass-pitch event, and I believe there's 16 signed up. A, a big pass-pitch event will only reach about 30, 35 teams, kind of the district pulling it down. But it's also an older crowd. spread these out over three quads? I mean, if you're having 35 teams, as many quads as you can, I mean, let's spread them out. Yeah, we can, we yeah. can spread them out. I mean, with the 35 team event and like normal home on it, we would use two quads and we would go. Because that's just really all that's required. Yeah. Um, I can look at the schedule. Um, currently, I'm almost positive we're not using our, our, other, our other quads. So, yes, we could, we could say, hey, we can spread out three quads. With 35. How many teams on the 11 from Oxford? Oxford from Oxford? Mm-hmm, from there. I don't think it matters. I, mean, I think it's what the mayor said. They, they go other places. I mean, if they're going to. Currently, um, for the for the August 14th event, we have, we have 13 teams signed up.
So, so, so if they don't play here, they'd end up playing somewhere else probably? That, that my only thought is if they're playing here it's at least we know the controls that we have in place and we have a little bit better idea of what's going on than if the teams are leaving town going out of state or somewhere else where we don't have the controls Yeah, for fans. If you can't social distance with your family group, because that's how the, the governor's order read, right? That's right. If you can't if you can't social distance with the family group. But I mean that's what his order is gonna say. Yeah, but we can go more strict if we want to. I mean, I think that I think the easiest thing to keep this going is to say, once you come in the gate, mask will require. If they're sitting in the outfield, the outfield they're more spread out. I mean, I've been by there where they're sitting in the outfield and they got tents up. They're they're a lot more spread out because once a person gets up to go to the concession stand from the left field line, they're not going to be having a mask. They're going through a group of people. It's just easier for you to control it once it gets inside the gate. And we want to keep, you know, if we want to keep these things going, I think they're, that's an easy ask. Who is going to enforce walking around and saying, sir, you're supposed to have a mask on? Well, you can we, weekend. I was about to say, can, can we not, I mean, I, just, just because he's, I think he's got a, a motion to be made there, but I mean, can we not figure out the enforcement whether through either whether it's through M Trade or through our code later, I mean we don't have to do it right now. I guess what I'm saying is we don't know we don't know how we're going to do it. Gonna, are we going to ticket people that don't have a mask on, or are we just having friends? I guess they just have to leave. I think they just have to leave. I think you say, hey, you need to put your mask on, and if they don't cooperate, then then you can leave. Well, I guess my point is we can't hire a bunch of fifteen year olds, which is what our full time staff is out there to go around and tell people you have to leave mm -hmm. the car. So, no, I, think, I, mean, I don't think we can put we our can, young. So what's your motion there, baby? That's my motion. <laughs> that you spread the games out as the master required within the gate, and um, we allow the tournaments to move forward. Okay, so leave practices and all that kind of thing as is. Yeah, I mean, I think the practices, I think they're they're doing pretty well. Okay, so we got a motion then to leave tournaments in place, require masks, I'm getting it right, require masks once you enter the gate. And to hire a security person for each squad to police that. Yep. Wear a mask for fans. I mean, you, your players. Players don't need to. Right. So players, coaches. 
coaches. I mean, a, anybody that's not a player. I mean, I, Braxton? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I think the. I mean, the order says that you, I mean, the governor's order says you wear them outside, outside, you can't be social distancing. That's what his. Well, when they're in the dugout, they can wear their mask, but once they're on the field, they don't have to. That's the easiest way to do it. So with the dugouts, you know, they're going to be wearing them in school. Right. Yeah. 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 In the National League, the baseball, they're wearing them in the dugouts. Yeah. That's right. This yeah. is not, it's not unreasonable to call it considered. No. Yeah. Act like Yadier. Well, just, just so I can actually just communicate, I know we're looking for this, but actually just communicate to the team that this is that you know, my question is, it's going to be fans as they enter the gate. I think if you play or coach anywhere, because you're not, you're not you running around. Like, treat it like restaurant style, like get up, put it in the dugout down there and have fun. Yeah. I think players and coaches have, I mean, not players in the dugout, they need to have their mask. Once they go out to take the field, they can take their mask off. Just like they do in the major. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Can we get cardboard cutouts for the for going major league? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. Uh, we'll count on you to call your cardboard. Uh, let me see. Um, their planned outdoor recreation activities. I assume if y'all are okay with them trades, if you're okay with OTC doing whatever. I think that it's basically follow the same the same the same rules. So if schools are delayed, are you still okay with OTC starting that? Uh, I mean, my recommendation would be for schools to reevaluate. And do not start on time. I think we push it back. In a place of I think like we are in Trey Park. Of I think at that you go. We see what the schools do first. Okay. We're right. Start Monday. They're oh, supposed yeah, to start Monday. So that we're there. But I think OPC will follow the school schedule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my yeah. mind, I mean that's going to follow. That's what yeah. we followed in closing it down. Yeah. Right. In closing activities down was we closed it down once the schools. Mm -hmm. I mean they. We're following school schedule, which we're also following hospital schedule. I mean, all of this is hinging off of everything. So, Seth, question: have, Has sign up for soccer and all that started yet? All right. So the plan is for soccer is we're going to continue on from our spring season. So the teams that were already formed for the spring and were playing their continual schedule in spring, those coaches have been contacted. Are you going to reach? Are you going to uh, come back? Uh, this fall, the coach, I can give you some numbers there. There's 82, um, 82 teams, 82 coaches were contacted. We have not heard back from four. Um, 24 are not coming back, but only 11 of them say it's because of uh, COVID related uh, things that are going on. So the intent is to finish out soccer season, um, and then after that, we'll come back to baseball and softball. And um, we took our rules and stuff, or state play guidelines, basically just from the baseball that went on uh, for June and July and just catered it over. What's your timeline on your soccer right now? Um, my board um, asks us when I come in here to look at the last week of August for practices and games and start beyond that. I think we just need to give them follow the same guidelines we set up until yeah. until yeah. we see this or this, mm -hmm. one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. But are they do they move forward with the school schedule when the school schedule? Open? I say yeah. school schedule. Yeah. yeah. Which they should be open by the last week of August, so. We don't need a, we need a motion? No. No, I think that, and Seth, while you're up here, so you don't have to come back, is there anything else that you want to present in the next agenda item? Uh, just uh, the safe play guidelines that I included there, just the few differences we made to soccer. Typically in soccer, you put your uh, both teams on one side of the field, you've got all of your parents on the other. Uh, we're going to run it the way we do typically play football. On side, one side goes the side of the other. They'll be marked with red and them. Uh, we're gonna have team boxes on each side so nobody can get in other than the team. Uh, we're not gonna lengthen the game, but we're gonna lengthen the game time. Like we were talking about earlier, we're gonna add 15 to 20 minutes after each game. So we have a clear complex. We have to bring it back in. Our indoor programmers who really can't do anything inside, we're gonna change their schedules around so they're gonna be at the complex. Um, you know, to help direct traffic because you know we can do more. We can hire. You know.
Yeah. Thank you. So Good job, Seth. No changes to OPC plan Thank you. Same thing for the restaurants. People are really uncomfortable when somebody they don't know is standing behind them, breathing down their back. Absolutely. I had um, a complaint even about our um, visit Oxford events this weekend where people were crowding uh, in front of City Hall. And, um, you know, you, you don't want to have to push somebody away. I'm surprised we haven't had fights over stuff yeah. like that. But if people will wear face coverings, you know, then we don't have to be as, as concerned with um, crowded spaces like that. I mean, and I think we need to do stuff like this. I, I don't want things to get worse where we wind up having to close right. businesses. I agree, yeah. I so mean, the face coverings are, yeah. you know, so many people say, I mean, they're such a punishment. We need to require face, face coverings outdoors in Oxford. Where social distance is, is not available, right? Right, because, I mean, where you can't social distance. So if you can social distance, I don't think you need a mask on. So as people are walking, I'm just going to give you some instances that will be very hard to do, fortunately. Um, you know, you can walk up to a group of people and say, hey, y'all can't be gathered without a face covering zone, and they all take two steps back. I mean, and then you walk off everybody back together. I, I, I believe from an enforcement standpoint, we, whether you define areas or whether you Yeah, I was going to say, what are, what are our problem areas? The square? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. where else? But there are other That's restaurants right. that yeah. I'm not going to list them all specifically, but I, I mean, there are other restaurants that have long lines. Yeah. Can, can, right now. can we not just go to, uh, you know, basically it's like opening Oxford, opening our restaurants safely, when we first started, we asked our restaurants to take care of their lines. Actually, yeah. can, can, I mean, this whole thing should go around the restaurant slash retail. You need to take care of your lines. Space them at six feet apart. I mean, that's what I do in my business. And, and you've just got to go by CDC guidelines. Yeah. And they should be following those, which I believe say be six feet apart in lines. Um, we can say wear a mask if you're in those lines. If you're in a line in, in the city, you go by mask. If, it, if it's iffy, it's the enforcement of it. Um, That's going to be anywhere. I had a long conversation yeah. about it yesterday. It, it, is, it is difficult if some people walk around the square should have one on because they're not socially distanced. I mean, because they are socially distanced. Some should have it on. It, it's, it's basically impossible for someone to walk around and enforce that. And y'all may be okay with that. But just saying, I don't, it's not. If everybody would do the right thing, we would not have all these oh, really? That's the thing. No, that, that's <laughs> <a> <laughs> if they would do the right thing, you wouldn't have to have it. 
So we're, I'm, I'm just gonna, I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but um, the easiest enforcement thing is to say everybody has to have face coverings on outside because the, then you're going to have the enforcement officers in the lines to get in the bars and all this, being able to easily say you got to have a face covering on, but they're not going to mess with people who are getting gas out next right. to their car or something else. But I wish there was just a better way to say like the downtown business district, you gotta have it. And anytime you're in any line to get in any restaurant, you know, once you make a decision to go somewhere, you gotta have a face cover. And that business should cover, I mean, should be taking care of the lines. They I mean, that's- They should be assisting at They least. should be assisting and yeah. saying, you're in line, you're standing out here, either be socially distanced or put a mask on, or just put a mask on. And I, I mean, the one thing, I'm gonna agree with John that we should say that, and, and I think Mayor, you already said it, but. Y'all, we're doing this to keep businesses open. Mm -hmm. We're trying to do this so businesses can continue right. to go. So, yeah. John, I like yours that we just do it. I, I guess we know our intent, but how, how do we word it? Because our intent is when you're waiting in a line or you're in a crowded area, but then it gets back to, I step out of my vehicle to pump gas and there's no one around me or I'm I'm walking on a public street in our subdivision, or I'm walking in a park. That's a public place. Well, you could say in public places in which um, the public regularly passes within six feet of one another. Because you do mean, if you're out at the gas station and you're two feet apart, those two people just need to put it on. And if you did that, if you said that in, lo in locations or situations Nobody wants to have to confront that other person and say, why isn't your mask on if you want to stand on this side? So how you work? That, I think that's what you would say in, in any locations or situations where people are reasonably expected to pass within six feet of each other. And that way they don't have to put it on when they walk out their door uh, off of their lot. But, uh, but if they're at a gas station on top of each other or anywhere. Make that, that, I'll make that motion. I'll second it, but I do want to say one thing. You know, we're very concerned about enforcement, and it's going to be a problem, but even if the o OPD gets 50% of the people to comply, yeah, some people are going to spread out, and then they're going to come back together, but you're going to get a lot of people who are going to be compliant. And so, we're, you know, we have to chip away at this. We're not going to get 100%. But if we could bring the cases down by, you know, 50 a week, we've accomplished something. And I, I'm not sure what that govern, governor's order means, but it, it seems to me when they say in public places, they yeah. mean in places that the public can gather, yes. that are open to the public. A movie theater is open. I think that's what the intent of that is. I don't think what we're doing is beyond what the governor's say, Jason, you might want to amend your motion to say unless the governor's order is more strict, strict than what I just said. I'll amend that motion. Yeah, I mean, because I think it says that. Yeah. I'll amend that motion. All right. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
even some of your 24 hour uh, fitness centers who can track who's coming and going, but they're not even seeing more than 8 to 10 at a time. We know that we um, were sent an email from one of the gyms that had a person that was with a positive case that had been in the gym, but it seemed like the gym was very proactive in letting everyone know who had been in that facility and took the necessary precautions and, and what have you. So that's the only thing that I've heard. And you know, I need to go to one that has my eyes. So I can't speak from personal experience, but um, it does sound like they are all complying with what our orders are. We've not had any complaints, and we have complaints all day long on different businesses all over town, and we've not had one on the gym. So just wanted y'all to have that information. I think we um, just keep gyms as they are right now. And, and Mayor, I, I'm fine with leaving the restaurants and the bars the same as they are. You know, one thing I don't know that the public understands, I think, is important, is that bars and restaurants both have the same permit. So you can't, you know, we've gotten a lot of calls from people to please close the bar. Well, the bars and restaurants are the exact same. There's no, there's no um, different no, permits. There's no legal definition. Yeah, that's right. There's no legal definition that separates them. So that's why you keep hearing us talk about bars and restaurants and having the same rules is because in Mississippi state law, they're being defined as the same. Um, so, you know, again, we looked at the numbers of hospitalization rates. We continue to hear from both the hospital and from our state health department that it is family gatherings, weddings, showers, funerals, large gatherings like that where they are seeing more um, of the virus spread. So are there any, any discussion on indoor dining? I think we're good with those, and I hope we can continue to leave those open. I guess we need to keep evaluating the numbers as we go along. I'm encouraged about the statewide mask mandate. I think that's going to help a lot. People come to Oxford to shop. They're going to have to wear their masks, and we know that they've been wearing them at home, too, so that, that should be helpful. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Chief. So with those changes, and y'all made motion with your changes, then we had a tenth resolution that would be adopted to reflect those changes. And um, this tenth resolution would refer to the uh, Serving Oxford Safety or Recovery Plan phase two amended with this date. Am I correct, Bart? And would have those changes that you have made tonight included. And the only thing I would add is that Whoever adopts the motion to adopt the tenth resolution, add and that it shall include the latest executive order because we didn't have it out when we drew it up. So it doesn't refer to that number, right, okay. and we can add that in there. But if, if somebody's oral motion, yeah, to I think it. you're right. That's important that we have that um, included. And usually, the governor's um, orders are oh, immediately right. on the Secretary of State's side that this was signed. I move we adopt the tenth amendment. And which will include the latest executive order of the governor. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you all for that discussion. And I don't believe there's anything else. Probably Seth is there from Oxford Park Commission. Okay, you got it. Okay. Um, number nine on our agenda is to authorize an appointment to the Municipal Election Commission. This election commissioner uh, recommended by Alderman Bailey and accepted, so I would recommend you all win. Move we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So we still are looking for one more member of our elections commission. Anyone who is interested should um, reach out to City Hall at OxfordMS.net with a letter of interest. Thank you. Now, first reading of the proposed ordinance amending Chapter 18, Section 18-71, definitions to add subsections <laughs> A through D, and to add Section 1878, keeping emissions dollars to the code of ordinances of the City of Oxford, Mississippi. This is the first reading. You, you have before you in written form the ordinance. I'm not going to go through it, but I'll tell you how it's structured. And if we have more time at the second meeting, the public hearing, we can actually read the definitions. But what we did was add to the definition of the current animal ordinance of vicious dogs. And then we added a section two under 1878 that says that if there's a complaint of a vicious dog, it's then brought to the court to make the determination that the definition is met. Um, or otherwise, it's just an impossible task we decided for the police to go out there and know the history yeah. of the dog and make that determination. 
we may still have some discussions with the judge and the prosecutor on how that will work, but that's how it's currently set up. And then Section 1879 doesn't say you can't have one, although the judge can put in order that you can't, but it says if you do, here are the things you've got to do. You've got to keep it inside or you've got to keep it in a fenced enclosure that it can't get out of, not just an electric fence that other dogs could get into or children could get into or an underground fence. It's got to be physically barriered from, from the public. And, and that's the general, and then there's a penalty. Uh, yeah, it says penalties for determination. We may still tweak that because the penalty is if you determine to have violated the vicious dog ordinance, not just that it's been determined to be one. I think it's the intent, and so you may need to change that heading. But there, the penalty is the same, um, $500, not less than 500, not more than 1,000, and imprisonment not to exceed 90 days or imprisonment. And as always, that's for the judge to determine. Yeah, I um, want to thank uh, one of our citizens who, first of all, brought this to our attention after a little puppy was killed by five vicious dogs that uh, we didn't have an ordinance. And that was um, Leslie Walkington, and she even gave us some verbiage to use in developing this, and, and we really appreciate that. A couple of things I want to point out that might be something to think about. We do have in there that um, an owner of a vicious dog is going to be required to carry liability insurance of $25,000, which, you know, I don't know whether that's something that we want to require. Uh, it, a lot of, we got a lot of this information from MML. They sent um, ordinances from other cities that dealt with vicious dogs. So that's, that's where that came from. Um, also, I was talking with Ben this morning. There's a signage requirement for uh, a fence or an enclosure that says beware a vicious dog. And it says here it, it needs to be a minimum of uh, 10 by 12 inches. And we want to put in there not to exceed six square feet because that's the maximum for our uh, temporary signs in residential areas. So we won't have any giant side signs. So it won't conflict with our sign ordinance at all. Um, and I think that's about it, but I guess we'll have more of a discussion on this next week, but you all got a ton of emails, I know, from people encouraging us to pass this ordinance. I had no idea there were so many vicious dog attacks in Oxford. Um, the the uh, Mississippi Critters folks didn't have that many. They had about eight that they told me about, but OPD has a bunch of incidents of people being bitten or animals being um, killed or injured by vicious dogs. At least, Janice, this is going to get rid of the, uh, the underground fences on the vicious dog Absolutely. because that's what happened to this. I mean, yeah. the other dog went over I know. the underground mm -hmm. fence. But it could have been a kid. Their children, yeah. children, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So no underground fences if you have a vicious dog. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Second reading and public hearing of a proposed ordinance amending Chapter 2, Administration, Article 8, Section 2 236, Composition and Terms, the City of Oxford Code of Ordinances regarding the Historic Properties Commission. Okay. Paul, you doing that?
selection of the other board members is on to the particular trees. Uh, consideration will be given to the twin trees. There, if they if one goes wrong or whatever, you can you can choose whoever you like or right. Right. It's totally up to you. Mm -hmm. And this is our second reading of public hearing. Does anyone from the board have any questions or comments? All right. Does anyone from the public have? Newly approved. Wear your mask. Um, Second. Move we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Consider change order number one for the water line relocation. Yes. Consider change order number one, including final quantities for the NRCS railroad stabilization project in the amount of forty nine thousand eight fifty four seventy four. The city's portion of the ten thousand nine sixty eight estimate. Yes. And this project, uh, Gospel Storm Cristobal came through it's the length of time that we have awarded bids and the contract is doing work. Wash away more of this load, and we did not feel that was something that was the responsibility of the contractor. It required additional dirt to be brought in, and so this change order takes care of that. Um, it's also final quantities, so work is complete. The project is uh, all of that is completed, and our share would only be the ten thousand nine hundred sixty-eight because NRCS re um, reimbursed us for the approximately seventy-eight percent. They allow us to count our engineering time and those things in our. Move we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? Consider change order number one for the water line relocation project at the intersection of Highway 7 and South Lamar County Road 401 in the amount of $30,490.90. Yes. And um, this project is when we got out there and got to work, the ground was just saturated. Um, the equipment wouldn't just stand up. And so we had to, when they excavated, they had to bring in select materials to hold the pipe in place. And so that is the result of this cost. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? Consider a request from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the board to serve as a study sponsor for a stream bank erosion investigation along portions of Davidson Creek. Yes, and this one is um, a request that we would make to the Corps of Engineers for them to come in and do a study of this area. The U.S. Dev Lab contacted us about coming out and looking at some erosion issues they had on site and some issues they had with structures that are on their
those leaders and also to make us aware of the impact of those structures on our community. Mm-hmm. So they, they notified us that if those structures failed, we are going to see more flow, um, more potential for damage downstream, which would be um, problems along club views, our bridge, our sewer line, our sewer connections. Um, so they just wanted to talk to us and let us know about that. And then this uh, funding source is available. So the board has a program through their But you'll bring it back to us. Yes. Okay. So we've got, um, there are one time engineering and our police department engineering special services that I think would cover, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, but we, I would come back to you. Um, well, there's, there's too many homes and too many condos down there now to not, uh, not yeah. do it. Absolutely. But, you know, I grew up playing in that crew, and I, I know of at least two times the Corps of Engineers has, has done, has done yeah. that crew. Yeah. It's just a problem. And I think this would be something um, I think we've talked about that this group along Clubview, that there was a, a potential for a project before that would have been larger in scope and may have helped stabilize it more and the neighbors did not want that because of their concerns about what was done in the backyard, about the appearance, about the riprap. Um, so that, you know, many years ago, those those uh, residents at the time, they were concerned about what it would look like. Right Bart, now. we just did one, didn't we? Uh, or, or didn't we have to get with the neighbor that was complaining over on Clubview about... Uh, Yes, we did, but we didn't do the NRCS. Okay. No. They didn't get awarded the NRCS. Okay. So, so they applied for it. They, yeah, so we didn't get those, it. Those funds are going to be so small that if we realize, you know, there, there, are, there are four or five homes right there in that small area that have a need, and I think the, the funds are enough to cover maybe each one, but it is not going to take care of um, the, the needs that we can even see. I, I move we move forward with the study. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Uh, I just have a question for Bart first. I didn't read the whole franchise agreement. Is it similar to our Max South agreement? It is similar to our Max South agreement. Uh, and realize that Max South has the most favored nation clause where they're having one word that, that allows, and I think they both have it, that allows we serve one district as they get the same deal. And, and we covered all, covered all those bases with Greg Fender and Max okay. South. Okay. And one other question. Are they going to be required, like Max South, to be able to provide this service to all of uh, the city of Oxford? No, they're not. This no. agreement does not provide a bailout clause. Mm-hmm. It, does, uh, it, it just doesn't provide a bailout clause. Okay. Hmm. Now, when Max South had that agreement, was it uh, before we an- were, were we annexed all the 
I'm going to say Max South, the difference in the two agreements is when Max South did it, saw a closer agreement, one they dealt with with it. When Max South did it, it was when Six C was more intense, it was emphasis and tension. Emphasis. So when it was a new thing. The, you know, today, today well, is a new sweater. You know, <laughs> today It doesn't, it, not everybody has to have it, I know. Mm -hmm. It does It does require the PED status of, of public uh, educational government channel that right. we can use if we wanted to, mm -hmm. but it, it does have that same type of requirement. Yeah. Okay. I move we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We opposed. All right, thank you. I would ask you to consider an executive session. Second. Aye. Uh -huh.